Flags at Venture Labs, we believe that startups are engines of transformation. And so a lot of what I'm going to describe is innovation in the context of startups. Um, and I'm going to talk particularly about the work we've been do doing in microbiomes, the human microbiome, the microbiome of foods, and the microbiomes of agriculture, and a view that we have on how that's going to change multiple industries. So part of our belief, let me be sure this is working is that we're in an absolutely amazing era of biology. I mean, in any engineering discipline, it's usually anticipated by just banging stones together before you can figure out how to make cathedrals. And this will be the century where we actually get to make cathedrals in biology. And we think startups, like in other industries, are going to be engines of this transition. And if you're looking for places to build cathedrals, agriculture, which I'm going to talk mostly about today, is an amazing place to look. We typically think about it as a process. You plant seeds, the plants grow up, and you harvest food. But it's actually pretty easy to make a case that it is the world's most important technology, period. Some support for that. It protects us against more disease than any innovation of the biotech era. It employs 40% of the global workforce. It supports over $5 trillion of global markets. It's likely one of the most important levers in driving the advancement of health and economic gain in the developing world. And it sustains every single one of us on Earth. It's a pretty cool technology. Even better, it does it via food, which brings us together and connects us. It's, it's a huge part of what we derive happiness from. It's something that shapes our memories and is a part of how we organize our daily routines, our yearly routines. And as tempting as it is to think of agriculture as a process or a technology to create foods, it's even more than that, in that agriculture's final product is us. You could think of it as a solar manufacturing process that produces us. On an atom-by-atom -atom basis, we're made up of atoms that plants on farms around the world are gathering from their atmosphere and pulling from their soil and delivering to us as carbon, nitrogen, and micronutrient atoms in the medium of foods. So hard to find a more fundamental, a more emotive, and more important technology. Yet the conditions in which we're practicing this important technology are getting harder every year. Today, we're unsustainably withdrawing water on many of the acres in which we practice agriculture. A significant fraction of the land in which we practice agriculture is degraded or at risk of degradation. And every year, we're growing crops in hotter, drier, and more extreme global climates. And in the face of those challenges, this is what our rate of improvement in agriculture looks like. This is different from every technology trend that has been talked about over the past two, 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 two days. And this isn't on purpose. We're not sort of putting, you know, letting our foot off the gas pedal because we're sort of enjoying the scenery and the, the industry is, is doing fine. In fact, it's coming at a time where if you extrapolate the status quo, it doesn't meet the WHO's projected food needs for the, the year of 2050. And sometimes that date sounds really far off. I'm going to come back to why it's actually almost an instant away. And um, we need new innovation to be able to bring to bear on this. And it's easy, if you follow the lay press, to have a pessimistic viewpoint on this because of daunting facts about the agriculture of today. It's a larger driver of climate change than the whole transportation industry is. It's the largest cause of biodiversity loss and habitat destruction locally. It's diminishing the fitness of species upon which it depends, like bees and other pollinators. And we've seen multiple food crises over the past several decades. Yet, amidst that anxiety, we could either be pessimistic about the future or be nostalgic about the past and reach for an agriculture of old and wish that we had it today. I would argue that a better approach would be to take the optimistic viewpoint on this. And in this case, it's amazing. So let's imagine that we solve this. Well, then that means today we have an opportunity to reinvent perhaps the technology that enabled human civilization in the first place, one that will touch 10 billion lives in this century, 
and which delivers the actual atoms and energy that make up our biology. And, you know, let's, let's be optimistic about what we, what we want it to look like. Let's make it better for our health, better for farmers, much better for the environment. And I'm going to talk today about the role that we see the, the microbiome and the science around microbes playing in a potential agricultural revolution. First, what is a microbiome? Simply put, it's a community of microbes that live in a common habitat. Sometimes it's defined as the genetic material of the, microbial, of the microbes that reside in a common community. So that means that microbiomes are everywhere. They're on the surface of this carpet, the surface of everybody's clothes. They're in any bite of cheese. They're in every breath that we're taking in this room. And that's actually not a bad thing. Um, because microbes were on this earth for two billion years before higher life forms emerged, they've figured out how to be able to interact and in fact support the fitness of higher life forms around them. And we're no exception to that. We host microbiomes on every one of our body surfaces. Imagine your skin as a desert where microbes reside. Imagine your lungs as a moist cavern where microbes reside. Imagine your gut as a swamp with microbes in it. You have about 30 trillion microbial cells as a complement to a similar number of human cells. So on a cellular basis, we're maybe half microbial. And if you just think about, take the microbes that live in your gut. What an awesome home that is. They get fed on a regular basis. They're kept warm. They're protected from the environment. If there was a Zillow for microbes, that would be you know, the neighborhood to be living in. And now it's clear that we pass our microbiomes on to our kids. So just play that out, that simple evolutionary incentive for microbes to be maintaining their habitat and for, to be improving the fitness of their host because that's a dominant lever on their own fitness. Well, that would mean that microbes for hundreds of millions of years have been flipping every light switch that they can touch in our physiology for the purpose of trying to improve our overall fitness and health. And so, Given how quickly microbes can evolve, it might not be surprising that they can produce the majority of metabolites in our blood, that they regulate our metabolism and our immune system constantly. And if you disrupt the microbiota, you can disrupt the host immune system and actually cause metabolic diseases like obesity. It's maybe not surprising that they actively protect us from pathogens all the time. After treatment with certain antibiotics, it can be as if you're immunocompromised not just because of disruption of the, the regulation of the immune system, but in fact because you've lost these defenders of their habitat, which is you. And every day there are new glimpses of how our microbiota has its tentacles into our neurobiology, into our reproductive fitness, into our longevity. And one of my favorite quotes as to just perhaps how pervasive and important our microbes are in our fitness is that comes from Lynn Margulis, who originated the theory of endosymbiosis, that our mitochondria were once free-living microbes, is perhaps humans are just a device that microbes invented so they could go to the moon. <laughs> and so take Neil Armstrong's famous quote and substitute one small step for man and one giant leap for microbiome. And it puts some of this in perspective. So this has been an absolute revelation over the course of just the past decade. And this new picture that's emerged is that although the discovery of microbes by von Leeuwenhoek, uh, Koch's formalization of germ theory and the idea that some microbes at times can do you harm, is a realization that at this instant, the vast majority of microbial relationships that we're all experiencing collectively are vital to our health. It's, it's almost as fundamental as if we had discovered a new human organ just during the biotech era. And if you think about it that way, it's not too surprising that a new human organ might change the way we practice me medicine in a bunch of ways. Today, we arrange medicine on the basis of our organ systems. You go to a neurologist, a pulmonologist, a gastroenterologist, a dermatologist, a cardiologist, who respectively will advise you on the health well-being or treatment opportunities for the function of your various organs. We don't have a microbiomologist that you can go to and who can advise you about the, the, the fitness of your microbiota and what you could do to repair or augment it. 
So that's likely going to change. Second is that every single one of our human organs has tens of billions of dollars of drugs targeted not towards eradicating that organ, which is what antibiotics do today, but towards driving the physiology or modulating it in the setting of disease in order to be able to treat diseases of that organ. So it's our view that drugs for the microbiome could be a new $100 billion industry. And some of what we've been doing has been building the, the platform capabilities and technologies in order to be able to enable that. So I won't talk about those today, but as we started thinking more and more about the relationship between us and microbiota, some of the ways in which our modern pharmaceutical tools can accidentally uh, decrease the fitness of our microbiota, it occurred to us there might be a whole bunch of parallels in agriculture. And the thing that captivated us more than anything wasn't just that plants are surrounded by microbes, but that if you take any plant in the world and you cut its tissues open, they're all full of microbes on the inside. Just think about that for a second. That means that every stalk of corn in a field, every root of soy, every leaf of wheat has microbes residing on the inside of those tissues. Now that's an amazing home. If you're going to sort of flip on Zillow between the human swamp or this, it might actually even be more desirable for a whole bunch of reasons. So if you're living inside of a plant, you're protected from the environment, you are kept hydrated, you're fed on a regular basis, and maybe plants even pass their microbiota on to their progeny. So that might motivate you over hundreds of millions of years to tinker with every light switch in order to improve the net fitness of that host. So what if the plant microbiota had been evolving a means by which to influence not just nitrogen stress and fixing nitrogen on behalf of a subset of crops, but every trait of fitness importance and therefore importance to agriculture, drought stress, heat, cold, salt, micronutrient stresses, protection from a whole bunch of different insects, fungal, bacterial, viral, and plant pathogens. And maybe also the microbiome might be both more powerful and a more natural means of influencing the traits and the properties of agricultural crops. Most of our agricultural technologies today take the form of simple chemistries and proteins. And even a single microbe, if it's been evolving for a given purpose, vastly surpasses the sophistication of a single chemistry or proteins. It has hundreds of proteins that are coupled like a machine to be able to influence hundreds of biochemical pathways. And if you think about what happens when seeds are planted, both we've found with a microbiome that's on and in that seed from its very beginning, but also with the extraordinary array of microbial diversity around it, the microbiome adds hundreds of life forms into the net biology of crops, perhaps providing a correspondingly extraordinary software within which you could augment any trait of importance to agriculture. So we arrived at a realization that's similar to what most of this conference is about, which is that there's an opportunity to be able to examine this biology in a way that wasn't even possible three to five years ago. Due to dramatic seed decreases in sequencing costs, a revolution in data science, unprecedented connectivity and tool enablement across the globe where anybody with a cell phone and a pair of scissors can give us a plant sample and we'll know the GPS location, the time of day, the weather history of that site, infer the stress profile that it was under, infer its fitness from a photograph, and then be able to figure out the plant species and sequence the microbiome at an inc ever increasingly uh, diminished cost and an enormous investment of hundreds of millions of dollars into the science and tools of the human microbiome that could be applied to plants. So we've built an effort that we call Indigo, focused on being able to rapidly collect and understand microbiomes at a global scale for the purpose of being able to drive a revolution in agricultural productivity. Key to our mindset is just this notion that evolution has been tinkering this with this for hundreds of millions of years. You could think about the whole world as just a big petri dish of plants under different stresses, surrounded by microbes, filtering those microbes and taking a subset of them into its interior, and then co-evolving with those microbes in order to be able to influence the stresses that that plant is under. So that's a lot of discovery that's already been happening. 
And before we even touch a pipette, we get the benefit of all of that. And one of the things that we had posited and now we've realized is that, in fact, many of the technologies we've been using over the course of the past 100 years in agriculture inadvertently can drive enormous decreases in diversity in these systems and, in fact, drive an extinction or a loss of functions that we've observed can be quite important to the fitness of plants. So there's two opportunities here. One is just to rebuild some of the things that we've accidentally lost over the past several decades in modern agricultural crops. The second is to be able to understand this whole gene pool of microbes and to be able to dial in a software tailored to the fitness profile that you want for any given crop in any part of the world. And we've been building a discovery process to be able to make this possible. In an area of new science, it can be tempting to do a whole bunch of experiments without a guided mindset as to what you're trying to achieve. And in this era of biology, you can actually structure an ambition that was impossible 10 years ago. So you could think about the whole world of agricultural crops as a big cube of different geographies, different crops, different overlapping stresses that those crops are exposed to. And we've been building a discovery program matched to the urgency of the challenge, focused on doing this now, of mastering the biology of how microbiomes improve plant performance across a very wide diversity of habitats around the world, plant hosts around the world, and using data science, high throughput screening, and then all of the capabilities to be able to deliver commercial products to farmers. The platform we've built for this really starts with that view that plants have been co-evolving with microbes, and we want to learn from that not just to solve one problem, but to solve a, a set of initial problems for farmers while understanding how these microbiomes are structured globally. So that every time we solve a problem, we get better and faster at solving the next two, four, and eight problems. And so we've built an avalanche of capabilities to be able to start deciphering some of the structure and function of these communities. We've now, um, ourselves and with collaborators, isolated 36,000 plant samples from stressful habitats of extraordinary variety. Think plants that are capable of living under salt water. Think plants that are in deserts and extraordinary at surviving in some of the most horrid and awful weather conditions imaginable. Modern crops, agricultural relatives of modern crops. We've derived from those 40,000 microbes that we've sequenced the genomes of, and we've begun to understand the core microbiome properties or overlapping constituents across over a trillion dollars of agricultural crops. We've been devising hypotheses based on those and testing those in the greenhouse for four years and in global field trials for the past five, and we've just deployed our first commercial products this spring. Many people probably know what this is generically, this is a network map of relatedness between different components of agricultural microbiomes across a subset of the sequencing that we've done. In our view, this is one of the first treasure maps for this era of microbiology in agriculture, where the relationships underpinning these communities allows you to not just test every microbe that you can culture, but actually devise which microbes should be tested for which conditions and be able to rapidly iterate on that process. The re result of these kinds of predictions you can see here. This is our first products that we've commercialized in cotton at the beginning of this year. We've put these now on 50,000 acres across five states in the United States. On the left, you see plants that had the simple addition of a microbiome coating to their seeds. And on the, on the, on the right, rather, on the left, you see the exact same commercial cultivar with the exact same seed coating, but for the addition of these special microbes. We discovered these because of their ability to influence the crop's fitness and behavior under water stress. And we've routinely seen 10 plus percent yield improvements in the crops as a result of the addition of these microbes. To put it in perspective, the whole era of GMOs has added arguably about 5% of yield into the, uh, the fitness and the yield of crops to which those traits have been deployed. And the annual average yield improvement is about a percent per year. If we can deliver this, this adds about a decade of advancement into agricultural uh, productivity. And this is just the start. So we've seen this effect now in multiple crops. We're commercializing wheat this fall. And this is really an invitation into a realization, which is that if we're right about this, the plant microbiome is going to have a huge impact on agriculture. And it's going to be able to do it quickly. 
And where this will go is biology like software, as much of the themes of this, of this community have been discussing. You can imagine a more natural agriculture for billions of people on the basis of microbiome software for any seed planted in any location, and where you take some of the scarce resources in the world, like fertile soil, and actually digitize that so that it's applicable to an arbitrary location with a customized microbiome for that plant, for that surrounding, in order to be able to dramatically improve its yield, improve its stress tolerance, reduce the pesticide use that today is, is distributed across hundreds of millions of acres, and drive less water, less fertilizer use, fewer inputs, while also being able to redefine maybe the way we define marginal lands. If you start to open up a definition of a microbiome agriculture, who knows where that's going to go? So we're enthusiastic about this and a vision for, for healthier plants, better foods, greater diversity. I want to come back to the broader invitation here, which is that this is one of these areas where innovation here has the dual opportunity to have a huge impact on the world, but also to be able to create an ex extraordinary amount of economic value. Agriculture is feeding us, clothing us, and making us up every single day. And we need to dramatically improve its efficiency. If you think about it as a solar manufacturing process, that's an invitation to anyone from a physicist to a plant physiologist to a chemist to think deeply about the components that take the sunlight and deliver the atoms that make up our physiology and to introduce a new Moore's law for how that takes place. And to go back to the date of 2050, I realized this year through having a daughter with my wife that 2050 is the date when she'll be my age. And so, although that's been a microbiome experience of its own, it's also led me to realize that if I want her to get the benefit of living in a world with autonomous vehicles and all the, all the extraordinary technologies that are on the horizon, but also a climate, global food security, and a biodiversity around us that we enjoy, we've got some serious work to do. So I'd submit that perhaps redefining agriculture is the greatest healthcare and maybe the greatest environmental opportunity of our whole generation. And I look forward to accomplishing that with you. Thank you all.